barbecue grill regulator and you're feeding this uh, engine regulator at low pressure, that's great. But you may need to run high pressure a long distance or like if you're doing a mower or it's a large engine, you don't want to run low pressure directly out of the tank. You want to run high pressure right up to this. Okay. So in that case, we would use, uh, we actually are the only one on the market with an MSQ kit. And that stands for uh, motor snorkel quad fuel. We're the only ones on the market with a quad fuel kit, MSQ. And that means you can run an engine on high pressure, low pressure, uh, propane, natural gas, or gasoline. So with this setup here, uh, we can run tank pressure into this regulator and then it drops it down to 11 inches right at the engine regulator. So you get full maximum power out of it and run smaller lines. So, but we always recommend a safety red 10 pound safety regulator at the cylinder outlet just as a precaution. Because if something happened to the, the regulator, if something happened to this regulator, which is you know, an economy regulator, you're going to have tank pressure directly to this, which blows the uh, seat off the orifice and then gas is uncontrolled. And so uh, that's how you would run high pressure on a low pressure system. So it's just adding another regulator. So put that there. Let's see. I lost my sheet. Oh, here we go. All right. So again, if you have any questions, please ask them as we go. Uh, let's see. In the meantime, uh, Dr. Hugh, we could go to a customer mail from Kevin. Mm. Kevin's a fan of the show, but he has to work while, uh, during the time that we air the show. So he, he sent these questions in. Hey, cool. All right. So the first question is, if a 20 pound propane tank is recertified, do you have to have it purged again? Okay. You're talking about the 12 year check. Yeah. When they, um, no, the only time you have to purge a propane cylinder is if the valve is removed and at the atmospheric air pressure is allowed to enter the cylinder. If it's always sealed, then you never have to worry about it. Once purged, always purged, as long as you don't open the vessel. And, uh, and that's as simple as it is. So no matter what you do to it, as long as you... And that's what I was saying on the last show, I believe, is like the cylinder exchange racks. If you go to some of the yards where they uh, have these operations, I was involved with an operation in Atlanta where we had thousands of 20-pound cylinders. Well, now they're 15-pound cylinders because nobody fills them to 20 but, uh, in the racks. But there was thousands of them in the yard with all the valves removed ready for the next process. So the valves were pulled... And that's back in the, that was in the heyday when we were just switching over to OPD valves, overfill protection valves. And, uh, and so sitting in the yard like that, they'd fill up the rainwater and, and air, you know, of course. So once they were uh, sandblasted and repainted and new valves put in, you'd have to treat it like a brand new tank and purge it. So yes, only if it's open and allowed to have atmospheric air pressure re-enter the cylinder, would you have to purge it again? So I hope that answers your question. Uh, okay, we have another one here too, don't we? Yeah, so Kevin, uh, number two question is... Same guy? Same guy. Hey, cool. I'm going to store my generator in a small metal shed, five foot by four foot by four foot with the 20 pound propane tanks. I'm worried about the temperature in the shed in the summertime. At what point will the propane tanks release their gas from the temperature increase? <laughs> okay. Well, we have a few things going on here. Uh, obviously, you don't keep a dog in the shed with air conditioning like some famous people do. So, uh, let's see. I wonder where he's, I wonder where he's at uh, in the country. But anyway... 
I guess my first thought is storing the cylinders inside the shed, is that really necessary? Is there any way to put them outside the shed and pipe the line through? That would be the best idea. Anytime you can find propane to a space, that's where you can have a so-called explosion. If propane is re, uh, seeps out at any point in the shed, it, it'll wait for you. And I was talking to somebody the other day that said that they, I forgot what they blew up, but they didn't smell the propane and it lit up. Uh, boy, who was that? Man, I wish I could remember that story now. People tell me stories I forget, but they never smelled it because it was like in the basement coming up uh, and something silly had happened. And it's never the propane's fault, believe me. Uh, I've never seen an accident, and, and I'm not saying it never ever has happened, but uh, I, I went to a, when I was a service tech for a gas company, I had a call to go check our, our cylinder at a house that was no longer there. And uh, when I pulled up, the, the corner of the, the house was across the street in a tree. And you could see the window and the curtains. It, it was really a freaky thing. It reminds you of one of those home shows, you know, where they show you, this is the way, you, you know, the wallpaper looks if you're on the outside and the vinyl siding. That's the way it was. The corner of the house was in the tree. Well, what had happened is two guys were living there. Uh, and both of them liked to imbibe... Uh, uh, alcoholic beverages. Uh, the one removed the space heater for whatever reason and uh, the other one came home and it was cold and he said oh I better turn on the tank and light the heater. Well he turned on the tank outside by the time he got back in uh, having fallen down multiple times and tripped over the dog or whatever he got in the house flip the switch and woomba. So point I'm making is propane is not explosive. It's highly flammable, but if you can find it to a tight space, it, it can cause things to blow up. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is if at all possible, last resort, don't bring a 20 pound cylinder into anywhere, if at all possible. Now, having said that, uh, the temperature in the shed in the summertime, well, as I said, uh, and, I, and I do commend American Welding uh, Tank Company for their wonderful chart. It makes it real easy to answer these questions. Uh, the relief valves, I cannot remember the relief valve release rate on the cylinders, but uh, if the shed got up to 130 degrees and the gas was allowed to, to climb to that temperature, uh, you'd have 257 pounds of pressure, which Guaranteed, the relief valve is going to seep. So, um, <laughs> so that 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 question has a lot of buckshot to it. So, I, I would really say don't don't put the cylinders in the shed if there's any way possible you can put them outside the shed, please. Um, you know, some campers they put them on the tongue of the camper. You know, they, you don't want them inside the camper. Uh, so. Does that sound right, Mr. Producer? I mean, you're the doc, doc. Well, it's just they're gonna they relief valves on on these cylinders are designed to bleed off, which causes the propane in the cylinder to boil, which it boils at 44 below zero, starts cooling off the gas. As the gas cools, the pressure drops, and then the relief relief valve will reseat. And so if you've ever been to a fire where a tank is involved uh, and it's not a nasty fire, just let's say some bushes catch fire near a tank, it'll, it'll do the, like the, it'll, like a train, it'll psh, 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 sound like a steam engine, it'll, psh, then it'll stop. And psh. Uh, my sound effects aren't very good, I realize, but it'll blow off until it reduces down and then uh, seal back up blow back off, seal back up. And I've, I've known of them doing them, doing that until they're completely empty. And then that's the end of that. So, uh, hope that answers your question. All right, Brian, where are we going here? No more questions? We got it. We do have a question. This one comes by 
YouTube. Hey, YouTube. Uh, this is Rock and Randy. Rock and Randy. <laughs> Rock and Randy wants to know, uh, he wants your recommendation on the size of a natural gas hose with quick disconnects for running two Honda EU2200Is in parallel, 40 feet from the meter. Where's my, I don't have any natural gas charts up here. I sent him uh, a link to the chart. Oh, did you? Uh, uh, and I can show it on the screen, but. Uh, so you're running natural gas um, to two, those are, uh, two point, uh no, I'm sorry. Oh, hold on. We got, we got our, our co oh, look at here. All right. Thank you very much. Now you got to remember, and I need to, I need to, here, hold on. I lost my ball. Oops, lost my stethoscope too. I'm not a real doctor. I just play one on the internet. But I do use a stethoscope all the time, believe it or not. If you want to know why, just ask. I'll tell you. But uh, I mean, here, here it worked, <laughs> not anywhere else. Uh, so you have two, two, two thousands, and how many feet from the gas? Forty. Forty feet. All right. If you go to the chart, it'll tell you that uh, the smallest pipe size is half inch for eighty thousand BTU, which would be like eight horsepower worth of fuel. Um, so, uh, I would definitely say that I have no clue, but having said that, um, Looking up the horsepower. well, see, I invented these charts 20 years ago. The thing is, uh, let me see here, 40 feet. 3 eighths tubing. See, our 3 eight, our three eighths hose is basically like half inch of surface of a fever. Yes, ever, ever. Quick disconnect. I mean, you're guaranteed at half, in, uh, half inch hose to be. Uh, if you want to be safe, you could run 40 feet of half inch hose and then tee off to three-eighths hose. Like, if you're gonna do two little six-footers to each unit, uh, just run half inch up to the T and you're guaranteed to have enough uh, gas volume. So, 40-foot um, half-inch hose would be great. Uh, now, I don't know where you're gonna put your quick disconnect. If you're gonna do it for each unit, uh, you could have it right there at your T with your two little shutoffs. And, and the, teeth, uh, the quick disconnects do have back checks, but you're really not supposed to rely on those for shut off. So uh, I can envision a half inch hose to a half inch T, two reducers with your shut two shut offs, the reducers down to three eighths, uh, quick disconnects, which are, which are low cost, because we try to save you money on that part of it. So, uh, so you're guaranteed at a half inch, but uh, three eighths is, is a stretch at 40 feet, uh, three eighths hose. So that's my recommendation. 40 feet a half inch hose, tee it off to two three eighths hoses. That's going to save you. I hope that helps. Okay, now we have a question from Facebook. This is Gary. Hey, Gary. He says, if a pop-off goes off on a tank, is it required to replace the pop-off. I work in the midstream compression field. Hmm. I've never heard of that being a requirement. If if it isn't broke, don't fix it. I mean, it, we we I'd have to check the NFPA 5458. I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll write that down and uh, uh, once once the relief valve. I know in some situations, like in large commercial industrial applications, it, it's, it's just a, a, a smart practice to do that. Because sometimes the relief valves, uh, you know, the springs can get corroded or could be a mechanical issue with the relief valve. And so you, you would want to do that for safety reasons. But if you're talking about like a grill bottle or something, um, 
we have never replaced them due, due to that because they did their job. That's what they're there for is to relieve the pressure. And once they do their job, they reseat. And as long as they reseat, they're fine. I mean, I, but uh, I, will, I will investigate that. We have, we have the NFPA 5458s, uh, which is the rules for, uh, nat uh, for gas industry. Uh, and we'll give you an answer. What was it? What was his name? That was Gary. Gary. And he was from Facebook or YouTube? Facebook. Hi, right, Gary. I uh, hope you're not in a hurry. You might have just been curious about that, but uh, if you just want, you know, my years of service in the industry, we've never, we've never replaced one because of that. Uh, there's a follow-up question from Gary. He wants to know if there's a kit that will work on an Echo 223 weed eater. All right. Not knowing what an Echo 223 weed eater is, is it two cycle? If it's four cycle, uh, we have done them because it uses that same uh, Warboro uh, diaphragm carburetor. And we haven't messed with one lately. I, but you know what? Um, I probably have one of my girls right now checking that too. What was that? It was a uh, Echo 223. Weed eater. Uh, I assume that's a shaft type, not a walk behind. Oh, you, you've Googled it. <clears throat> Does it say two or four cycle? Come on, Gary. Two or four cycle. While we're waiting, I will say um, we haven't released it to the general public, but we have successfully operated a two cycle engine on propane for an extended period of time with, with no uh, damage to the engine by using a particular uh, technique we came up with, which is quite interesting. And I, I think we need to get on the ball and release that um, but you know, when it comes to patents and all those things, you, you kind of take your time, but uh, it was interesting how we discovered that. Engine. Yeah, okay, so it's two stroke. Well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's in our, we have done it and can tell you how to do it, but um, we haven't done the long-term testing. We did. How many hours did we put on that unit, you think? Which one? The two stroke that we ran on propane. We ran it the whole day straight. That little generator? Yeah. yeah. It's like eight hours at least. I think it ran for many days. I am thinking, yeah, I'm thinking it's it 20. Three or four days. As a matter of fact, one of our goals was just to fire it up and hook it to the natural gas line, put an engine meter on it, and just let it sit out back and run <laughs> till it stopped running. <laughs> And then check the hour meter and say, okay, you could run it this long uh, because a technique we used. So uh, if you're really interested, it, it could be coming soon, which would be kind of cool because you could have a little, you know, backpack system for your propane cylinders. And uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, direct answer, no, you can't use a snorkel on an Echo 223. <laughs> but, but stay tuned. Uh, all right. So no more uh, live questions at this point. And by the way, I guess I can say that the, uh, the two cycle engine that we ran for uh, 20 some hours probably was the uh, Harbor Freight, that little, was it $99, $95, Harbor Freight two cycle, 1500 watt generator, whatever that was. Very impressive. Uh, all right, no more questions. What, what do you have here for uh, 
Are you going to show the Predator installation video? What is, is that? Yeah, so what we like to do is, you know, for people who uh, are seeing the show for the first time, we like to demonstrate, you know, how an installation is done, and uh, it gives people an idea of... Um, oh. <clears throat> now, this is the one where I can't narrate. Is there a voice on this one? Yeah. So, well, one time there wasn't, and I couldn't narrate because I couldn't see it. So it was kind of like... So it doesn't take long to watch. So we'll be right back. Brian's going to run the Predator installation video. Hello, I'm Dr. Hugh, and we're going to snorkelize this Predator 2000 today. I have a lot of respect for the Predator generator from Harbor Freight. Uh, actually, it's to me, it's the best made Chinese clone that I've seen. You know, I invented the word Chanda back in year 2001 and uh, I've seen a lot of bad ones but this they really have a nice motor so we're gonna start unboxing this thing She's fresh out of the box, so of course we have to run it for two hours uh, on gasoline. Uh, that makes sure that the rings have seated, and also make sure the thing works correctly. I mean, you hate to snorkelize it and find out it didn't work correctly, but it is true you have to run them on gasoline uh, before you can snorkelize them. Now, I mentioned earlier that this about the Chandas. This is actually a Chamaha. Yamaha. It's a Yamaha copy, and uh, you, can, you can tell right away by the tail end of it. Yeah. But uh, the snorkel that you use on this is the same one we use for the Yamaha 2000 uh, inverter. So um, we're going to take it outside, put some gas in it, put a little load on it, and come back in a couple hours. Welcome outside where it's a million degrees. We, we all put on our shades and our hats because it's brutal out here. However, we don't run this thing inside on gasoline. So we're gonna start it up. Sean's gonna get us going here. We're gonna move it, let's go ahead and do that. Move it to starting. Uh, we got our gas cap open like we're supposed to, or idle switch is zero, binary zero one. And we're ready to pull. Let's see how many strokes it takes. Hey, first pull, I like it. They say to wait on the output light, 66 decibels, this sounds about right. We're going to use a reliant meter to show the wattage. This is a 2000, but as you know, it's not really a 2000 per se, it's a 1600 running. We're going to, we went through all our blow dryers and we came up with one that's around 1680. Should be no problem for this unit. So we're going to put that on there. And All right, showing zero. All right, can you see that? All right, so. We're going to break it in under half load, so go ahead and put it on low speed. There's no reason to put it under full load. It's under low speed, it's pulling 400 watts. So we're going to let it sit out here for a couple hours. And, uh, and if it doesn't melt, and the blow dryer doesn't melt, and we don't melt, we'll come back and get it after it runs out of gasoline. All right, we're back inside. We ran it out of gasoline. And now we've installed our gasoline petcock in line because of the intrinsic valve that shuts off the gasoline and the spark at the same time. You can see how we've uh, added it to the spark plug access hole. That way you can move it to change the spark plug and it's still easily accessible to turn on and off for alternative fuel or gasoline operation. 
Well, first we're going to use our U.S. Carburation Special Mounting Bracket to uh, mount the regulator to the tail end of the generator. So uh, we're also adding our uh, thread sealant to all the fittings. And of course not the calibrator itself, the uh, stainless steel nut and bolt that never gets sealant. So then we add a few washers to the bottom just to make the um, heat shield a little more effective. There's an access cover for the spark plug, to change the spark plug at the top because this is an air sealed cabinet. So we opted to remove that completely and we provided a new one in the system package that uh, is pre-drilled to allow the snorkel tube feed line to pass through and so you you would pass the obviously the non-snorkel end through the hole from inside out and uh, now we're popping it back off because we're going to be adding some uh, tachometer wires to the same cover and when you see it you'll notice it has three holes in it one for the tube and two for the tachometer and so now we're finishing adding our uh, tachometer to the unit it has there's, there's dual plates on it. You can mount the tack on left or right side, turn it whatever direction you want. The holes are already there, self-tapping screws, and there you go. It's nice to have a tack. You know what's going on with the machine. We're routing our wires, routing our, we're getting all tangled up, of course, because if you get two wires anywhere near each other, they're going to get hooked on something or around something. So pass them through, get them through a cover, And so now we're, we're through there. Now we've removed the nuts that hold the air horn onto the carburetor. And the tubing was popped loose to make that easier as well. Get that all out of the way. Now, slip the probe in past the choke plate, which is open, of course, like always. And the, uh, the rubber will slip right over the studs. We opted to leave the original OEM gasket on there. You can leave it on, take it off, doesn't matter. Now you put the uh, air horn back on there with the, the original OEM nuts and pop the hose back on. And now the snorkel is on board and ready for operation. The hose can be cut to length if it's too long for you. We found it to be just perfect. But we give you wire ties. You can wire tie the, the tack wires to the tubing. Running our wires for the tack. There's one that goes on the spark plug and one that grounds. Down inside, we're wrapping the spark plug wire four or five times and a wire tie. So we're bringing it inside. We give you a little horseshoe type electrical connector to slip underneath that ground nut. Now it's interesting, there's a tapped hole in the bracket inside right above the unit ground, right below the green wire, green yellow. Above that was a pre-tapped hole. So we give you a screw in there to put on that horseshoe fitting for the wire and just screw it right in that hole when you got a ground. And now we put our cover back on, put our screws back in. And now we're going to connect our fuel supply up, which is of course three quarter inch, three inch flare. You can put a quick disconnect, you can do whatever you want right here, but we're just doing the basic NPSK six to six foot hose with all the fittings you need to hook to a, a cylinder. Uh, here's the tack installed. Because we just hooked our tubing up, uh, gas lines is all have air in it. We primed it a few seconds and off it ran. Still has some residuals in it. Got a little gasoline residual.
pulsing. Isn't that nice? Remember our gasoline? Um, 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 um. Look how sweet. It's saying overload, but it's still running. So go ahead, take it down. So we can safely, I mean, we can overload <laughs> it keeps running on propane. The gasoline, it couldn't even handle the overload. One more time for fun. We don't want to hurt the machine. Put on the echo mode. Well, so it's still putting out wattage on echo mode. Is that sweet? And guess what? We're all breathing and we're not dying in here. There you go. Snorkelized. Ah, I love it when they run so good on propane. You can see on gasoline the thing couldn't even handle a load full load for any period of time. Get your motor snorkel, put it on your generator, hook up your propane or your natural gas. Yeah, I'm gonna make some power, hook up some lights or my TV. Oh, finally done. Hey, welcome back. Uh-oh, nobody comes to the door. I know. Hey, uh, hope you enjoyed the video. If you got any questions about any of the stuff that took place on that, please let me know. Um, glad to answer those questions. Wanna, we've got to um, do the trivia question. And if you've been following the show at all, you know that I posed a question as to what tools continue to work even when you're not using them, all right? You don't need them. They're still working, even though you don't need them. And so far, uh, I allowed the stop sign, which is okay. That's one. Uh, but one of my favorites is a level, because no matter what, it is always working. It's always doing its level best, all right? And a level and a ruler. Ruler is always telling you how long it is. Or I guess how short it is. Now, if you can give us another tool that um, keeps working, even when you're not using it, we're giving away, or we'll send you free, a U.S. Carburation Hour Tachometer. It keeps track of the hours your engine runs. Uh, also has um, tack, so you can set your load, load block calibrator. Two-wire hookup. You wrap, wrap the red wire around the spark plug uh, wire and ground the black just to keep it honest. And it has a lifetime battery. And uh, what's retail on that? 30. 39. <coughs> yeah. And we'll send you one free, free shipping, free everything. But if you act right now, we'll send you two, two for the price of. We do have an, intr an entrant. An entrant? A compass. Let's see. Let's see. A compass. Hey, wait a minute. I had a compass. Oh man. You're absolutely right. Excellent, excellent call. I had a picture of a compass. How long happened to it? Oh wait a minute. It might be in my paperwork. Hold on. Yes. So that's one for today. Who was that? What's in there? Who? That was Gary. Gary. We had Gary, Gary from Facebook. Yep. Way to go, Gary. Yes, you're absolutely right. And so you get a engine tachometer. We'll send that. Make sure you. Uh, he might have won one in the past. I'm not so sure. Is he eating up our tax? He's our number one fan. Come on, dude. Eating up our tax. Share the love. All right. But hey, what's fair is fair. We didn't have a disclaimer. Yeah, only one, only all on winner per entry or something like that. How's that go? Uh, a clock. Well, what if the battery's dead, Rockin' Randy? Ha 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 ha! That's true. Uh, a clock. We're only supposed to give away one per show. All right. We'll give Rockin'. You do have a. Uh, now wait a minute. Are you making an announcement about Rockin' Randy? Please. Give Rockin' Randy one. All right, just send us your uh, mailing address. It's got to go by mail. 
were too cheap to go UPS on those things. So, uh, uh, not to cut you off, what what do you say, a clock? All right. Let me see. I want to make sure. I got I got pictures of stuff down here, you know. All right. Um, coming back to I'm going going back coming back going back. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about was the calibrator and people aggravate us to death over the fact that we do not recommend sealant on the calibrator bolt okay and it and i understand it mechanical guy you have threads meeting thread it's like man there's pressure there you got you have to have sealant because we have sealant here and we have sealant here but none here it just doesn't make sense does it well guess what i'm going to explain to you when this engine regulator is functioning under load, okay? So coming out of coming out of the, the engine regulator, all right. Here's the load adjustment calibrator. This this hose to the carburetor, you'll never guess what the pressure is. Well, let me start off by saying it is negative pressure. So it's below atmosphere. And as we know, there's no such thing as vacuum. There's only negative pressure, okay? You can't add vacuum. And you can prove that. It's like, that's, how, that's what holds this ball up. When you do this, see how that, you can take that. Now you see I'm blowing pressure and hitting the ball, but the ball is staying in the air. How is that? Well, the pressure here is lower, and so the atmosphere is, the pressure above the ball is lower, so the atmosphere is pushing it up, all right? It's obvious by the fact that it, we're using positive pressure. That's how you can use positive pressure to create a so-called vacuum pump. So, having said that, what, why don't we use sealant on those threads? The pressure at that point is 0 0.1 inch of water column, okay? There's 28 inches and 1 PSI. So what does that equate to? The negative pressure at that point is 0 0.003 PSI, which is pff, nothing. That's why there's no, there's no sealant there. And sealant just gums up. It's going to slow you down. It, it, it's of no, and we've been doing it for 25 years. It always works. It's not a problem. It's not an issue. Uh, so please don't put sealant on that. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and this is one of my favorite sayings. When people really want to argue, I say, well, how come you don't put sealant on a spark plug? <laughs> And there's 125, 150 PSI. You don't use sealant on a spark plug. And then somebody's gonna say, yeah, but you got a special, hey, there is no sealant on the threads of a spark plug, all right? So, I can't keep my stethoscope going here. All right, so where are we at now, Brian? There's no more questions? I got no more questions? Uh, there was a question. Oh, cool, question. Boy, that's a deep one. Uh, so this guy, this is Mitch. Mitch says on YouTube, says he has two generators, 7,000 and 7,500 watt on propane. Both have cooked the exhaust guides and seat. Am I missing an adjustment? Leaning out, question mark? I can call if that is better. Well, there's a couple things I'd want to be, make sure off the top, um, you know, age, where they run on gasoline a lot before you, you, you switched them over. Uh, and that is a good point to bring out. Uh, if you're going to be using an, en an engine on propane, natural gas, and gasoline, please keep that spark arrestor clean. Those things gum up with that black soot from uh, gasoline. Horrible. So always make sure your, your, uh, your spark arrestor screen is clean. Uh, 
and I can assume you made no modifications to the exhaust itself, exhaust system, like uh, like the one customer did that he he made an uh, an adjustment to his exhaust system, and this wasn't actually a pretty nice radio. I, I love the RCA connectors still stuck in the back, but. Uh, having said that, if you haven't adjusted anything to the exhaust system, then yes, uh, propane lean is cool and clean. Uh, so always set it to the lean side of the mixture. So that could cause the valves to get hot if you set it to the rich side of the mixture. Now. Uh, it is not an issue at all burning valves with propane natural gas it it is not an issue you can read all you want from the the junk on the network but we have proof positive uh, what's that unit over there 60 some hundred or 40 some hundred yeah we have our yamaha that we keep in our showroom uh, with the engine meter showing 6700 hours we just had, we have one in the back shop right now that has a governor issue. Uh, it can't, when you put a load on it, it just can't keep up. So we need to dig into that thing and find out why the uh, velocity governor isn't functioning correctly. But it has how many hours on it? 2,500 2, hours. Compression was 100 and what? <laughs> yeah, 150 PSI not an issue uh, i always tell the story about our uh, our delivery truck down in florida we had a brand new truck converted it to propane it was a gasoline truck it was a uh, 30 30 3500 gallon bobtail it's one of the biggies and it had over 300,000 miles on it and it just slap wore out it had no compression after 300,000 miles and it was a sedentary truck in other words it filled 1,000 gallon tanks all day. So you'd hook up, gauge the PTO, and it would just sit there and pump off for 20, 20 minutes. And uh, so the odometer really didn't read right. So in your case, if both of them are doing that, um, definitely keep it lean, keep it lean. Lean is efficient, cool, and clean. And uh, we need to, you know, I'm gonna do an episode on that where we can show how leaning out the mixture the temperatures drop and uh, if you have one of those get one of those uh, infrared thermometers uh, you can get them at Harbor Freight or something I think we got them there for 20 30 bucks just something to show you you, you see dialing in on that mixture it'll 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 cool off gasoline is a liquid so it'll rich it'll actually perform a cooling process so propane and natural gas won't do that it's already a vapor so I'm sorry to hear you on that kind of issue. Uh, the last thing I would hope that you don't have it like uh, uh, our buddy Kevin was gonna put his in the shed. Uh, and that is a good point. I hope he's not gonna run them in the shed. If he is, you need to make sure that you take precautions. There is, There are some tricks that you can get by with running them in the shed of that, that's a small size shed, 544, but uh, there's some tricks but we don't tell you any of them because we don't want to be responsible for anything. Uh, oh, we have a live studio audience well, question. I was going to add on to that. I get a lot of customers that want to extend the exhaust out, like they'll have it in a shelter, and they'll try to use a small pipe, mm. and it can be dangerous to do that. Yeah. Yeah, the exhaust... Um, if you need to if you need to extend the exhaust and you just won't accept no for an answer uh, most manifolds are tapped but you'll notice that uh, I, I need a drawing board I'll go back to it if I had it I don't even have a pen all right well here you go I got a pen all right so let's say on your on your manifold you'll you'll have a hole for your for your exhaust right and and that that kind of gives you the idea of threads right but outside of that you'll have a hole and a hole typically 
So let's just kind of make it look like it might look. So here's where your muffler uh, exhaust would, would screw on. So you'd screw it here and here and go over that. Well, what, you're, what you notice is the flange on that adapter that goes over that is going to be the same or larger than that hole. So what customers will do, and I've done it before and made that mistake, is they'll thread a nipple into, into that, because these are threaded, so it looks so perfect. Oh, I'll just thread a, a, a short nipple in there, okay? And then I'll bell up, bell increaser, to something to go out. Well, what you've done in effect is you have an eighth inch on each, you know, you're, you're using typically schedule 40, so you have an eighth inch. So if that's, a, if that's a half inch, if that's a half inch hole and you put a half inch nipple in there and you take an eighth inch off, now you only have a three eighths inch outlet. So if you absolutely feel you have to do this, you should come up with a way of matching that pattern that you can bolt it on and then thread in something large there, like three quarter, say that's a half inch hole, you know, go three quarter and then, and then bell up. You just don't want any back pressure on your, on your system. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, with the gentleman with the two 7,000s, I wonder if they weren't the same brand, I wonder, but, um, uh, you know, the mufflers could be an issue, but definitely don't take that easy route out and go, oh, I'll thread a nipple in that, in, in the head. It just, uh, is going to choke you down. So definitely don't do that. And I hope that makes sense. It makes sense to me when I say it, but I don't know if it makes sense when you get it. Cause you know what you'll have? Hey, I, ha -ha, I got to tie it in. If you did that and put the little nipple in there, you end up with a time bomb. Huh? It'll work for a while. You'll go, hey, well, that sounds good. Man, look at it run. It is running great. Wow. It's quiet. It's running great. Hey, just blew the motor. I had this when I was a kid. You know, when I was a kid, this thing was a bowling ball. Ordered one on eBay came in, the mail label said time bomb. Post office held it up for three days because the guy who sent it to me wrote description of the contents was a time bomb. Shouldn't do that. But anyway, that's what you have. You have a time bomb if you do that. So uh, hope that helps. We're always glad to lend advice. We just don't want to be responsible for it. It's good advice. Don't get me wrong, but you know, people always want to blame you. Well, you said if I did this, I'd be okay. And it's like, no. He said, you know, other people have gotten by with it. But anyway, have I bored them to death? They're done? All right, guys. Well, guys, gals, men, women, children, uh, please like us on Facebook. I don't care. You don't have to like us. I don't even like us. He wants us, he wants you to like us. I don't, does that really hold any weight anymore? I guess it does. Hey, if you haven't watched our viral video about the 20 pound cylinders in the rack, you gotta watch that one on, that's, that's only on YouTube, right? It's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Cause you know, the 20 pound cylinder racks that you go for your barbecue grills are really only 15 pound cylinder racks. It is Get such- it on the best of Dr. Hewitt, your local blockbuster. The best of Dr. U on Blockbuster. And that's where, if you notice on this tank here, you'll see some blue tape. That, that's, the, that's the height it's filled to, actually, when you buy. So this, this holds, it's supposed to be up to here. This is 20 pounds. Well, let me turn a little more. Are you getting this, Mr. Producer? All right. So this is a 20-pound cylinder. It just so happens this is for a floor buffer or forklift. But if you, if you bought a 20, if you go to get your cylinder refilled, now you refill, it'll fill all the way up to here. That's 20 pounds worth of propane, 4.7 gallons. If you go to the rack, 
I heard that. Uh, we had a jet taken off in the back room. So if you go to Iraq and buy one, it's going to have that much propane in it. And that's 15 pounds, and they consider that full. And if you want to verify what I'm saying, just look, study the rack, the box, you know. You'll see somewhere it'll say minimum net weight 15 pounds. And that's what it is. It, and so you, you lose five pounds of propane. At 4.2 pounds per gallon, that's just over a gallon of propane. You, you think you're getting, but you're not. But the trade-off is they're lighter to carry because it's four less pounds that you don't have to carry. So I don't know. Anyway, that, that really hurt my feelings because, you know, I've been in the industry since early early 80s, so... Uh, like people get a square deal. All right. Well, no more questions. We're uh, we're bailing out. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, if you have any suggest, hey, we never said that. If you have any suggestions for the show other than shutting it down, uh, we will gladly accept them. Well, we'll even accept that, but uh, we won't do it. But uh, just let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You can always email us if you're working. Don't have time to see the show. Uh, email us. We'll get back to you. And we're sending out two tacks this week. I can't believe that. We're only doing one a week from now on. A disclaimer. And uh, we... Uh, I forgot how I'm supposed to end this thing. See you next week. Oh. All right. This has been Dr. Hughes saying glad to be with you. And we'll see you next week.